section 1. You will hear a conversation between a student and a librarian. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning. I'd like to join the library, please. Of course. Can I just see your student card? Here you are. Thank you. Let me just check. Your first name is Garba, G-A-R-B-A, -A, and your surname is Buwal, B-U-W-A-L. That's right. Can I just get some additional information from you for our database? It won't take long. Sure. Could I have your address, please? Here, in Newtown? Yes. 16 Bridgeway Road. Is Bridgeway written as one word? Yes, it is. Thank you. Which city are you from? Just the city. I don't need the full address. I'm from Lagos in Nigeria. And your date of birth? 25th of May, 1983. Which course are you on? MSc Engineering. Thank you. That's all the personal data I need. Your library card will be ready tomorrow. Would you like to pick it up here, or shall I send it to your department? I'll pick it up here. Could I just ask you a few questions? Of course. What would you like to know? I heard the library is open 24 hours a day. Is that correct? It will be from the 1st of October, but now we're only open from 9am to 6pm, because this week is only for orientation. There are no formal classes at the university. I see. It's very unusual to have a library that's open 24 hours. We are only the second university in the UK to offer this service. It was instantly popular when we introduced it on the 1st of March last academic year. What facilities are available here? I missed the orientation, I'm afraid. Well, you can see the three photocopiers over there by the large desk. The one nearest us is a colour copier. How much does it cost to make copies? Five pence for black and white and ten pence for colour. Only A4-sized copies are available. On the other side of the room, by the windows, you can see the computers. They have a database of all our books, newspapers, magazines and reports in the library. About half a million entries in all. Are they connected to the internet? No, we found that too many students wanted to use them. Besides, it's cheap and easy for students to get an internet connection in their accommodation. Those stairs lead to the rest of the library? Yes. On this floor we have newspapers and magazines. Users are not required to be silent in this part of the library, but we do ask that the noise be kept to a minimum. Upstairs there are all the books and reports. What's that room at the end there? You mean at the opposite end of the room, to my desk? That's the video and DVD room. We have a small selection of videos and DVDs that students can view, but usually an appointment needs to be made in advance. However, this is not necessary if the room is not in use. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. That is the end of section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a monologue. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Hello everyone. I'm here to talk to you about extending your leave to remain in the UK. Let me just check that you are all from outside the European Economic Area. If you are from the EEA, this information does not apply to you. OK, let's begin. The very first thing to do is to take note of the date that your entry clearance is valid until, or the date that your leave to remain in the UK will run out. This is the date when your current permission to be in the UK will expire. By this date, you should either leave the UK or extend your permission to be here. As a part of the initiative to attract more international students to the UK, many international students are now given permission to be in the UK for the full period of study. Students on courses of 12 months or more that end during the summer will usually be given permission to be in the UK until the 31st of October. Students on courses that do not follow the usual autumn to summer pattern will usually be given a period that includes two months at the end of the course for packing up and making arrangements to leave. However, some students are not given permission to be here for the whole of their course at the very beginning. If this has happened to you, you will have to apply for an extension of your permission to be here. Start preparing for the application about two months before your permission runs out. However, you should not normally make the application until one month before your permission runs out. To apply to stay longer in the UK, you must take or send certain documents to the Home Office. The Home Office is the name we give to what people in most other countries call the Interior Ministry. They must be the originals and not photocopies. Which documents do you need to send? Your completed application form, form FLRS, your passport and passports for each dependent if they are applying to extend their stay in the UK with you, if your passport shows that you are required to register with the police, you must also send your police registration certificate and certificates for each dependent if they are applying to extend their stay in the UK with you. You also need to send a letter from your college or university stating that you are still enrolled on a full-time course of study or that you will be beginning another one. Bank statements covering the past three months or other evidence that you have enough money to continue to pay your fees and maintain yourself and any dependents. A recent passport size photograph of yourself and similar photos of any of your dependents aged 16 or over if they are applying to extend their stay in the UK with you. FLRS stands for Further Leave to Remain Student. To get this form, you can download it from the Home Office website or ask at your college or university. When you are preparing to fill out the form, it is a good idea to read the guidance notes. You could also ask a student advisor or welfare officer at your institution for help. Now, where should you send your application? You can only send your application by post. Send your documents to FLRS, Immigration and Nationality, Directorate, Sunshine House, 28 Wellington Road, London, W1A 2BY. Send your documents by recorded delivery and keep the receipt as well as photocopies of everything you send. You can expect to wait at least four weeks and sometimes considerably longer before a decision on the application is made. I have some good news about the application deadline. According to new regulations, even if you do not have all these documents available, you must still make sure that you apply before your current permission to be in the UK expires. Enclose as many of the documents as you have and include a letter explaining what is missing, why it is missing, and when you will be able to send it to the Home Office. You will then be considered to have made your application in time. If your permission to be in the UK has already expired, contact either a student advisor or welfare officer at your college or university, or the Immigration Advisory Service on their 24-hour emergency line. 
or via their website www.iasuk.org. Please note that if you do make a late application and the application is refused, you cannot appeal against that decision. If your application was made in time and if your application is refused, you will receive a letter from the Home Office telling you why. The letter will also tell you whether or not you have the right to appeal against the decision. If you made your original application in good time, before your current leave to remain had expired, then you should automatically be given the right to appeal. If you have the right to appeal, you will only have a few days in which to exercise this right. You should therefore ask for professional advice about the appeal process as soon as possible from a lawyer, a student advisor, or welfare officer at your college or university, or the Immigration Advisory Service. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a talk. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. Good morning. Your name is Claire Sanders, isn't it? That's right. Well, Claire, as we explained in the letter, in this interview I'd like to talk about some of the things that you mentioned in your application form, such as your experience and academic background. I see. Now, for your undergraduate degree, you studied geography, right? That's correct, at the Scottish National University. SNU is a very prestigious university. Apart from that, were there any other reasons that you chose to study there? Well, you're correct in suggesting that the main reason I went there was due to the superior quality of the university, but there were two other reasons. The first was that it is reasonably far from my home. I wanted to be as independent as possible from my family whilst I was studying and felt that that was one way of achieving that aim. The other reason was that the university offered an excellent program of summer work in developing countries and that's something I was very keen on. That would be the Livingstone Project. That's right. I'd like to return to that in a minute. Let me just check the optional courses you took in your third year. The two compulsory courses were Methodology and Geography and Statistical Analysis. And I chose Infrastructure, Development Issues and Geology in addition to those. I see. You clearly decided to focus more on the human geography side of things. Yes, I had worked on development projects abroad for two summers as part of the Livingston Project. The first project was in India and the second was in Sierra Leone. Could you tell me the main aims of the project and how you contributed? The Indian project was to ensure that a village had adequate supplies of fresh water and adequate sanitation. On that project, my role was to help lay pipes and put together various pieces of equipment. The project in Sierra Leone involved improving the infrastructure. The aim was to create rudimentary roads between villages so that they could receive aid and so that they could get agricultural products, particularly fruit and vegetables, to the capital and larger towns. My job was to help choose the best route for the roads, minimising any impact on the environment while maximising efficiency. How did you find the experiences? The Indian project was helpful in that it was my first experience abroad 
and I got to see how small development projects can really make a difference. However, I found the climate, well, it was extremely hot and humid, and we were doing a lot of physical work, so it was, well, it made you appreciate air conditioning for a start. The second project, well, I enjoyed that a lot more. There was some physical work, but we had some machinery to help us clear paths through vegetation. I really enjoyed being able to put what I had learned into practice. For example, we had to choose a route on a map first of all, according to the contours of hills and valleys. Then we had to explore the ground and check that it was really a suitable route. And now you've decided to take a master's degree in development studies as a result. Great. Well, I just have a few more questions regarding. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on the geography of the United Kingdom. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this introductory lecture on the geography of the United Kingdom. The UK, with a total population of over sixty million, consists of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Great Britain comprises England, Scotland, and Wales. England is the largest country of the UK, with some fifty-two million people. It is mainly a lowland country, with some upland areas in the north and west. The capital is London, with about seven million people. There are many manufacturing industries, and farming is widespread. But the economy is increasingly service-based, and London is one of the world's leading centres for banking, insurance, and other financial services. High-tech industries have replaced many of the more traditional ones. In Scotland, five million people live in an area not much smaller than England. The country boasts vast open spaces and is one of the last areas of unspoiled natural beauty in Europe, featuring mountains, lochs (that is lakes) and glens (that is valleys). Modern industries, including oil, electronics, and biotechnology, as well as more traditional industries such as fishing and forestry, drive the economy. The largest city is Glasgow, but the capital is Edinburgh. Wales is home to three million people, and its geography is characterised by coastline, mountains, and lakes. Cardiff is the capital and largest city. Key industries include electronics, auto components, food processing, healthcare, and professional services. More Japanese companies have set up shop in Wales than anywhere else in Europe. About 1.6 million people live in Northern Ireland, the capital of which is Belfast, the largest city. Residents enjoy beautiful countryside. Many new hotels are springing up to cater for increasing numbers of tourists and business travellers. The climate in the UK is moderate. Summers are fairly cool and winters are quite mild. And despite what many foreigners believe, British weather is not rain and fog. It is actually more comfortable, more varied, and more interesting than that. What you can look forward to in the way of rain, sun, temperature, and even daylight depends on where you will be living. Here are some typical figures for London. January is the coldest month at three degrees centigrade, whilst July is the hottest at seventeen degrees centigrade. 
Rainfall varies from 56 mm in April to 81 mm in December. Although the UK is quite small geographically, the climate varies from one area to another. In general, the west is wetter and milder than the east, and northern areas are noticeably cooler than southern ones. For example, compare the following temperatures with the London figures. Edinburgh, 14 degrees centigrade in July, and Manchester, 15 degrees centigrade in the same month. Edinburgh, 4 degrees centigrade in January, and Manchester, 5 degrees centigrade in the same month. Parts of Scotland usually get snow in winter, whereas you might live in London for several years without seeing a significant snowfall. International students who are used to tropical or equatorial climates are often intrigued by the sheer variety of the weather in the UK. Weather in the early spring tends to be especially changeable. You could be treated to rain, snow, thunder and lightning, hail and glorious spring sunshine, all in the course of a single day. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test, the IELTS test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thanks for watching. Here are other two videos. You can watch them as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed my channel, please subscribe it and hit the bell icon for my upcoming videos and share these all videos among your friends.